Okay, so I have to say, when I was rehearsing this talk on Tuesday, my fellow C Sharp developers were expressed that they were particularly happy about the title because it excluded all JavaScript developers. <laughs> now, that's not really the point I'm trying to make, but I think it will come across anyway. Ooh, I'm scrolling there. Should be scrolling here. Yes. So, how's life as a programmer? Uh, this is the question that I've been answering a lot lately because I've only recently become a programmer. And I started my career as a tester. I had studied towards a Master of Science in Information Technology and I had taken the compiler courses and I had done the networking labs and the math exams and all of those things. But I found myself being curious about the topic which everyone seemed to dislike so much, testing. In fact, my fellow students would declare that if they were sure of one thing, is that they would never work with testing. But I dove into it and I loved it. I felt like a detective when I was trying to find bugs and trying to reproduce them to see what was going on and trying to see which variables triggered them. And I found my confidence and I learned that there are actually ways of working in which you can also prevent bugs from happening. So I spent years helping teams trying to split up their deliveries and have conversations about what the things were supposed to do, really. And then I started noticing that a lot of this was dependent on how well we were actually communicating in the team and how we decided to split up our work. So I slipped into the role of an agile coach or team facilitator, as I call myself. And I did that for a while. But then I quit that job because I wasn't happy with the way that company was going. And I decided that now it's time to be a programmer. Now I had written some code before. I had done some automated checks and I had written some small tools to help me in my testing. But I had never written anything that actually ran in production, something that a, that a user had touched. And now I've been a programmer for a year and a half. So how is life as a programmer? Well, I think that this picture of my cat pretty much sums it up. <laughs> I really like it. The one thing that strikes me, though, um, about being a programmer in comparison to all of the other roles that I've tried is that the programmer holds the power. You are the one standing between the idea and the realization of that idea. And by being that person with the compiler, you're in the control of the situation in a way which all of your other teammates are not. You decide what is possible. My dear friend and colleague, Toby, whom you might know from Twitter as Drunk Cod, told me the story of the period in his, in his career when he, was, when he felt the most powerless. And he was working as a product owner. And in his job, he had to prioritize. And in order to prioritize, he needed data. So he asked his team, can you please give me some data on which queries are the most common? And the team told him, no, that's not possible. Now, Toby knows his, ways around, his way around computers, so he figured, well, it really should be possible. He went to the operations team, and he asked them for the logs on those machines, which they happily provided him. He found some queries in the logs and he started writing a parser. It took him a couple of nights, but finally he had the data that he had been asking for. And so when he went back to his team, it was surprising to hear that not only was it possible, but now the team felt like it was very important that they had their hands on this data. Now we can only speculate what made these people say that it wasn't possible. Maybe they didn't know how to do it. Maybe they didn't want to do it. Maybe they didn't feel like it was important, and the easiest way to answer that is to say it's not possible. But I do believe that a lot of times when we are asked the question, is it possible, we're not really answering the question, is it possible? We're answering the question, do I know how to do it, or do I want to do it? It also shows what a particular place the product owner is in. You are, on the one hand, you have to set the expectations of your customers and other stakeholders and give straight answers to questions. But on the other hand, you are at the mercy of your software development team and the answers that they're giving you. So we decide. We decide 
who knows about what it works, how it works. So if I decide to develop a feature by myself, I'm making the decision that all of the thoughts and ideas and experiments and, um, and things that I run into are not important for my team to know about. They're only important for me. I can decide if I want to document something. I can decide if I want to write some, some units tests which will demonstrate the behavior of this thing. And I can decide if I want to share my thoughts and obstacles that I run into along the way. You also, you also have the possibility to sort of gain more of that power by deciding that you're not going to share anything about it. And I think that we've all met this person in an organization which is indispensable because they are the only ones who knows about how it works. Because they decided that they didn't want to share. And why are they still there? It's because they have the power. You decide over your time. You can decide when you want to start the task. You can decide in which way you want to split up your work and how you want to do it. This was very much different when I worked as a tester, where I would run into the situations where I had those mini deadlines, because even though I tried my best to prepare for, for testing when I would actually be able to, to touch the software, I had to wait for my programmers to actually get to the point where they felt like it would be ready enough for me to see. So I had to rush it at the end of the sprints, back when we were working in sprints. And what I, could I do to influence this? Well, I could kindly ask my programmers to please split up your work a bit differently so that I can test something earlier and give you some more feedback. But that's about it. You decide over the quality level it has. And again, as a tester, this is frustrating because you have this dedication to quality and to your users and you want to find the best way of doing it. But your power of influence is limited to what importance that the other team members attribute to your opinions and how much they respect you. This also means that you decide how long it will take. Do you feel that this refactoring really is necessary in order to be able to deliver this feature, then it will take longer and so forth. You decide. You might think that you're not deciding. Uh, I worked in a team where we had a product owner who used to be a programmer. So he knew everything about taking the time to refactor and taking the time to do work properly from the beginning. He loved pairing and he encouraged the team to do it as much as possible. But even though he was clearly telling them to do quality first, they felt stressed and wanted to work fast. He was giving them the mandate, the clear mandate to make these decisions, but they were deciding otherwise. So if you're a programmer, you're the person who turns caffeine into code. And by being this person, the person with the compiler, you and only you will decide what the code will look like. Without you, there is no product. So I want you to stand up for your product, for your users, and for your teammates. When someone asks me, how long does it take to do this, it's my job to include pair programming and writing automated checks and doing proper testing or having a discussion about what it really means to do this thing. It's my responsibility to do that because I'm the one with the technical knowledge. I am the one who knows which work there is that needs to be done. And so I might end up in this spiral or this evil circle, vicious circle, where if I want to be helpful and they ask me how long does it take and I want to be helpful, I want to say it goes fast, we'll get it back tomorrow. I'm setting myself up for, for failure because I will end up in a situation where I think that maybe I don't have time to TDD, it's better if I just write this code and, and add some tests later. Or, Pair programming, oh, pair programming really wasn't in the budget that we discussed, so we won't have time for that. And then I start introducing bugs, and then I start making architectural choices that mean that not only I, but also my teammates will work slower in the future. That maybe some other feature will have to carry this cost. So 
so the truth is that whatever expectations that I set up for my stakeholders when I tell them how long it takes or so forth, they are my responsibility because of me being the one with the technical knowledge. I am the one who does the work that needs to be done, and I'm the one who knows what work that is. And not only are you pretty much in control over your situation in this way, which others may, might not be, you're also in a pretty comfortable and safe space. I mean, mostly what we can complain about is the noise level in our, in our open plan office. And still, we can put on our headphones and listen to music and slip into the zone. There's no heavy lifting. There's no one yelling at you most of the time. There's no one puking on you at work. And at least in Sweden, I know that if I have a doctor's appointment or something similar, I can just slip away from the office and, and do that errand and come back, and no one will frown upon it. This isn't the case if you work in healthcare or if you work in a shop or if you work as a teacher. And it's rather safe. For one, there is little crime against programmers that I know of. And the consequences of our actions for most of us aren't that terrible. For most of us, the consequences are financial at worst. And in the grand concept of things and thinking of life and death in the situations, that isn't very terrible. Now I'm saying for most of us, because I know that this isn't the case for everyone. Remember that I said most of us. So, we're also having a lot of fun, right? It's nice to be this person who solves the tricky problems. And that feeling, you know, when someone comes by your desk and they ask you for a favor and you know how to fix it, and then they look at you all, all thankful and you feel like a goddess, that's a nice feeling. So, to summarize, Clickety click, it's clicking. Okay, it's not showing my screen, sorry. We are being paid a decent amount of money to work in a rather comfortable and safe environment where we have the agency to work with our tasks the way we want to. And we spend most of our days making people happy and bringing their ideas to life. So you know what? We're playing work life on difficulty easy. This isn't the case for most people. But this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just that you have to think about it, and you have to think about how you're using it. So let me ask you how you spend your time. Maybe you're spending your time helping society. Maybe you're doing this by helping those in need. I know of a company, for example, who is building drones to deliver medical supplies, in Malawi, medical supplies in Malawi. That's a good thing. Maybe you're teaching our kids and helping them grow. Maybe you're providing help for our elderly. Maybe you're improving the environment. Or spreading democracy in the world. Are you protecting our civil rights? Our freedom of speech? or maybe our privacy. Am I asking this because I would like you to change your job and do something grand instead? Not necessarily. To be honest, I cannot answer yes to a single one of these questions when I look at my current workplace. But I am happy at work. I find the problems that I'm solving intriguing. I have colleagues which make me happy. Their, their warmth and openness is making me really happy. And the way that they are tackling new things and, and learning new things is really inspiring. And that is enough for me. But I also quit my last job because I wasn't happy about the ethical decisions that they were making. So if you're lucky enough like me to be in a position where you can be picky, where, as in Stockholm, our 
In Stockholm, programmer is the most common work uh, profession that you can have, and they're always sought after. So we're wanted on the job market. So if you are like me, with skills that are wanted on the job market, someone who is lucky enough to have the luxury to have financial safety and stability, then you should be picky about what you're doing. You should be something that is making you happy on some level. You should acknowledge this privilege that you're having in, in your job, in your work, if you are one of those people who has this privilege. And make sure that you're not spending it the wrong way. If you are in a position in a company where you're feeling that you're being more, your energy is being more drained than you're getting energy, all you're doing is that you're spending your time making investors richer and you're being miserable at the same time. And not everyone has these opportunities, so be grateful if you do. And if you need a bit of a wake-up call, uh, you could go to keysleft.com and calculate how many keystrokes you have left in your life. <laughs> so how are you spending these? Are you writing a novel, or are you emailing your boss, or are you tweeting? I'm not putting any judgment in this, just think about it. You decide over your energy and where it goes. And I want you to follow your values and your beliefs somewhere that does make you happy. And while we are on the topic of values, let's think about this power that we have at the same time. You're the one deciding which if statements get written and which don't. So if your boss asks you to do something unethical, would you do it? Stack Overflow does an annual survey of developers, and they asked some question about ethics. They asked if you feel that you would write code for an unethical purpose. A lot of people are saying no. Some people are saying it depends on what it is. Now, I'm not sure what it depends mean, if you're feeling like, oh, it depends on if it's wrong enough, or if I care about it, this ethical aspect of it, it doesn't affect me, or something like that. But I would have loved to see these numbers being a bit different, a bit more on the no side. They also asked um, who is responsible for writing an ethical code. Is it the management of the company? Is it you or is it just the person who came up with the idea? And again, we are in times where no one is putting a gun to your head but you still don't want to take the responsibility for it. You feel like someone else is the one who should be responsible. And if we look at the current events, I bet that most of you have spent more time in these past few months thinking about user data than you have in your entire life previously. <laughs> because of GDPR, I know I have. Meanwhile, Facebook is making headlines about how their user data has been mishandled. And in China, private companies are inventing a credit score to keep track of their users. They will track, for example, what products you brought, how long you've been playing video games, and how positive are you when you're interacting with your friends on social media. And you can use this score to get a better interest on your loans, to uh, get faster check-in at hotels, Wired calls this a gamified version of the old Communist Party surveillance system. Now, I live in a democracy, in a time of peace. And I'm a bit concerned. If we are not able to stand up to our users, to our, our fellow citizens in this time where, where there is peace, what will happen then, in a situation where you're working in an oppressive regime, or a totalitarian state, or maybe even for a government which doesn't really understand how IT is used and how it shouldn't be used? These holes that we could be creating in our systems, these tiny holes when we're not, we are not thinking, they could be big holes, huge holes in the future. So I want you to think about this. 
here I was going to tell you the story about a supposed war hero. Uh, but as I was doing my research this morning, I just wanted to get some data on some numbers. I discovered that this was, um, this was not a true story. So supposedly a man called René Carmi would be saving Jews during World War II by hacking the punch card machines that they were using um, when doing census and not being able to write in anything in the column where he stated religion. This turns out not to have been true. It would have been a great story, but sorry about that. What was true, though, in this, all this situation was that in France, you had several different lists with censuses about people's uh, races and professions and so forth. And by having those lists separate and not really being able to put them together in an efficient way, you weren't able to find as many Jews as you were in, for example, in the Netherlands, where, where the lists were pretty straightforward. So there is some truth to the story. And there is still some time to think about this user data that you are collecting. Again, it might seem innocent today, but maybe it's not in the future. And I also want to give some credit to this, web, this site that I found where, where they were actually looking at news stories and uh, looking at the research behind them and trying to see if there's any truth in it. So that's a great site to go to if you have questions like these. That's where I found my, my debunking. So with great power comes great responsibility. And your power comes in many forms. And one of your responsibilities is to make sure that you acknowledge this power and use it for good. It's easy to slip into evil just by not thinking about the consequences, by not doing anything. So you can do good for the human beings that are working with you, your colleagues, your friends, by the way that you're working in your companies. You can be good for the company by standing up for your product and your users. You can be good for your own health by thinking about, is your job draining you of energy or is it giving you energy? And you can be good for society. If you have the energy, the possibility and the will to get involved in something that helps others, please do that. But even if you don't, don't let evil slip in just by being idle. You have the power over all of these decisions. You decide. Thank you. <laughs>